from the primitive settlers of the steppes until the time of Ivan the Terrible. The history of Russia is as vast as its territory. The story we are about to tell you spans more than 20,000 years of its history. Hermitage, treasures of Russian archaeology in Mark. We are in St. Petersburg, a city built from nothing by the Tsars and transformed into the capital of Russia. As a new city, destined to hold the mechanisms of power, the life of the population revolved around the Winter Palace. Today, this building forms part of Russia's first public museum, the Hermitage. In other times, it was the Tsar's residence and was home to one of the most glittering courts in Europe. Apart from the paintings and Raphael's gallery, my museum includes 38,000 books, four rooms full of volumes and prints, 10,000 sculptures, approximately 10,000 drawings, and a natural science collection that fills two huge halls. Catherine was an enlightened empress. Her private collections were the beginning of everything that is on show today at the Hermitage. Today, the museum brings together more than three million pieces which span from the prehistoric to modern art. It is, in fact, one of the largest art galleries in the world. We can say that the Hermitage has become an inseparable part of the image of Russia. Following a joint agreement, the governments of Russia and Spain declared 2011 the dual year of Spain and Russia. Russia and Spain are two nations imprescindible para poder entender la cultura, la historia y la identidad europea. Tampoco la historia del mundo podría concebirse sin la impronta y las aportaciones de nuestros dos grandes pueblos. Столь обширный и многогранный проект реализуется нашими странами впервые. И мне очень приятно, что в этой торжественной церемонии принимают участие король Испании Хуан Карлос I и королева София. Для нас это большая честь. Part of the cultural fraternity between both countries was to exhibit in the Hermitage an important archaeological piece from Mark, the archaeological museum of the province of Alicante. Discovered in the Roman archaeological site of Lucentum in Alicante, this piece represents a double-headed eagle a unique design in classical culture. It shows the pommel of a sword, which, in all probability, was held by a statue of an emperor. The double-headed eagle is part of Russia's coat of arms. For its part, Mark welcomes to Spain an archaeological exposition from the Hermitage. The pieces that are included invite you to embark on a journey through the historical genesis of Russia. Archaeological collections in the Hermitage are diverse, diverse, diverse and important. And they are important as much as our collections of art, sculpture or art collections. But in Russia, unfortunately, there are very few specialized archaeological museums. As a rule, they are small museums in the provinces or university museums. И поэтому нам, конечно, было интересно 
подготовить такую выставку, которая бы отразила все периоды и все эпохи развития древних культур на территории России и сопредельных территориях, и показать это в специализированном, хорошо подготовленном для этого музее, которым является Марк. We are in the last glacial period. The polar ice has expanded. It covers a large part of Asia and Europe. Our journey begins in prehistory, in the Upper Paleolithic period, about 25,000 years ago. Long before this, human beings had abandoned their African home. From there, they had scattered throughout the world. The Russia that we know today was a crossroads to Europe and to Central Asia. Being the frontier between two continents was to mark the whole history of Russia. That which made these people stand out from their predecessors was their capacity to create art. They left evidence of their creativity throughout the whole continent of Europe. Sometimes they adorned the walls of caves and sheltered rocks. In the Siberian archaeological site of Malta, close to Lake Baikal, various small figures were found which could be easily transported, intricately made movable art. The halls of the Hermitage Museum house outstanding examples of this form of art. Pieces sculpted in bone, marble or horn many representing animals typical of the last glacial period, like the mammoth. Some pieces could have been used as decoration. Others were, in all probability, used in rituals. In prehistoric art, the so-called Venus Paleolithics occupy a special place. In the archaeological site of Kostenki, archaeologists uncovered several examples of these types of figures. The Venus of Kostenki represents a woman with a voluptuous figure, like a wet nurse. Her breasts are supported by a piece which closely resembles a bra. This small statue could have reflected the desire for maternity and the survival of humanity at a time when infant mortality was high and when many women did not survive childbirth. Although they differ in appearance, both the Venus of Kostenki and this piece, discovered in the Siberian archaeological site of Malta, show the primitive likeness of a great mother whose existence guarantees life and fertility. In the same way, many of the petroglyphs of Lake Onega in northeastern Russia could be symbolic, in this case of the moon or the sun. More than 20 kilometers of coastline are engraved with hundreds of these designs. These petroglyphs are from the Neolithic period. The Neolithic period started after the last glacial period. The ice had receded. 8,000 years ago, the objects made by humans became more complex. The first villages were born. Pottery was developed. The reason for these changes was the appearance of a new form of economy based on agriculture and livestock breeding. Russia has the largest prairies in the world. The most widespread landscape is the steppes, an endless extent of low vegetation and grass. Here, the people of the Neolithic adopted nomadic pastoralism as a way of life. First tribes, later entire populations traversed the vastness of Central Asia, steering their livestock in search of pastures, bargaining with each other, fighting. The result of this mixture was a nomadic culture that with the passing of centuries and with the contact between peoples reached a certain degree of similarity. The pieces that we are looking at were buried in the tombs of the tribal leaders. Their burial sites are scattered throughout the steppes and always form the shape of a burial mound. They are known as Kurgan. 
Курган — это сложное архитектурное сооружение, которое строилось в древности из камня, из земли, иногда даже с деревянными конструкциями. И сооружалось это над могилой, над захоронением, которое производилось в земле. То есть курган — это часть погребального комплекса, часть могилы того или иного человека. Иногда э, в готовый курган совершали захоронение люди последующих эпох. И таким образом курган мог содержать в себе десятки, а иногда и многие десятки погребений от э, самой ранней эпохи бронзы до эпохи Средневековья. Most of what we know about the people of Scythia was discovered in the tombs of their kings. In the 7th century BC, the Scythians arrived on the north coast of the Black Sea from Central Asia. They traveled with all of their possessions and families. The Scythians were the first nomadic people of importance to invade southern Russia. There they founded the Kingdom of Scythia. The Scythians knew how to breed horses. They were hunters and herdsmen, always on the move. Great horsemen and fearsome archers, their tribes operated as veritable armies with which they devastated extensive parts of Asia. The Scythians then drink the blood of the first fallen enemy. And however many he may kill in the skirmishes and battles, he cuts off their heads and presents them to his sovereign. Unfaithful he who does not present a head, for he will not be any part of the booty. Only those who bring them will partake. The historian Herodotus was Greek. And for the ancient Greeks, those who could not speak their language were barbarians. From the darkness of the tombs of the Scythian kings arises a different version of this brutal image. This golden comb, buried next to a monarch, shows the Scythian taste for art. A refined art that found its maximum expression in work in bronze and precious metals. Scythian jewelry depicts the life of the nomads on the steppes. But above all, it represents animals, like the great horned stag objects that attempt to capture the essence of the beast whose magical protection they sought. For centuries, Scythian gold was a widely desired treasure, so much so that the Tsars had to pass laws against the tomb raiders. However, many of the pieces recovered from these royal tombs were not fully Scythian. The figure of this horseman, for example, wears a Greek, not a Scythian helmet. Almost at the same time as the Scythians arrived, so too did the Greeks. The Greek city of Mileto founded several colonies on the coast of the Black Sea. Their objective was to exploit the agricultural and mineral resources of the region, to monopolize the production of iron and cereals. The Greeks always felt under threat from their Scythian neighbors who were thirsty for booty. But through the contact of both peoples grew a culture that united the Mediterranean world with that of the steppes. Greek works of art, like those shown in the expositions in the Hermitage Museum, can be found from the Iberian Peninsula to the Scythian burial tombs. Greek craftsmen produced jewelry in the style of the Scythians. Because of their contact with the Greeks, 
the Scythians began to abandon their nomadic way of life and started to practice agriculture. Anacarsis is considered to be one of the seven wise men of Greece. However, on the steppes, he was known as the brother of the Scythian king. Anacarsis was a philosopher who traveled to Athens to immerse himself in the Greek world. Upon his return to Scythia, Anacarsis was assassinated by his brother. In the same way, the Scythians were overcome by another nomadic tribe, the Sarmatians. Later, to the north and west of the Black Sea, emerged the kingdom of the Bosporus. It included the territories of the ancient Greek colonies. Plagued by the tribes of the steppes, the cities of the Prospers ended up depending on strong foreign nations and became a protectorate of the Roman Empire. However, the destinies of the Kingdom of the Bosporus and of Imperial Rome were already written. Гуны не были, появление гунов не было той причиной, которая привела к разрушению Боспорского царства. Хотя э, во время нашествия гунов в конце IV века э, Боспорское царство, конечно, э, пострадало. Э, но в конце V века оно просто потеряло свою независимость, попало в сферу влияния э, Византийской империи и э, получило статус федерата. Вот. Но в конце VII века, на рубеже VII-VIII веков, э, Боспорское царство исчезло окончательно, под э, ударами хазаров. The next wave of invasions that were to shake Europe were to come from the north. The monk Nestor, author of the first chronicle of Russia, tells us about the impact they had upon the Slavs. There was no law amongst the Slavs, and each tribe rose against the others. Then they said, let us choose a prince to rule over us and who will judge according to our custom. Thus they went far from the sea to the Varangians and they said to the Varangians, our land is large and rich, but there is no order. We pray that your princes come to rule over us. The Varangians in the story were kin to the Danish Vikings they helped the Slavs to unify their tribes. Together, the Varangians and the Slavs formed the Rus nation, known as the ancient state of Russia. The aristocracy of the Rus were Varangian, but immersed in the Slavic world, they wasted no time in assimilating it completely. Less than 40 years after the arrival of the Varangians, their princes had Slavic names. From the beginning, the Rus worshipped the gods of Slavic mythology. However, as we know nowadays, the Russia of the following centuries was to be Christian. We move to the year 988. Vladimir governed many warlike tribes, divided by local issues. To maintain stability, it was necessary to unite them and in order to do so, Vladimir turned to religion. Furthermore, the conversion of his dominions to Orthodox Christianity had other advantages. It served to strengthen bonds with Byzantium, the great Orthodox Empire of the time. Shortly before ordering the conversion of his people, Vladimir had celebrated a state wedding with the emperor's sister. Icons are a form of art that originates in Byzantium. During the Christianization, Vladimir ordered the destruction of all pagan symbols. 
With the passing of time, icons were to acquire a genuine Russian character. For monks, to decorate an icon is a spiritual exercise. Icons are panels on which personalities of the Orthodox faith or consecrated objects are represented. During two centuries, there were 83 civil wars. Inside old Russia, too many independent principalities gained power. In the year 1240, a new invasion, originating in the Orient, this time Mongolia, raised the city of Kiev to the ground. Commanded by a grandson of Genghis Khan, the Mongols founded the state of the Golden Horde. Its dominions extended from the rivers Dnieper and Volga to Central Asia. From there they forced the Russian principalities to yield to serfdom. Moscow was to be used as a collection center for tributes. The Silk Route, Imperial Byzantium, and the Mongol invasion all left their mark on Russian culture. Moscow prospered until becoming the capital of a great dukedom. It headed the victorious struggle against the Mongols and, during the process, dominated the rest of the principalities. The city of Moscow became the Third Rome, the seat of the Russian Orthodox Church. The Muscovite dukes proclaimed themselves princes of all Russia. In the 16th century, Ivan IV, the Terrible, whose palace lay here, was first to be crowned Tsar. The Russian word Tsar comes from the Latin word Caesar. Ivan defeated the nobility, strengthened the state, and established the foundations of a new Russia, an empire united beneath the Tsar and the Church. We find ourselves in St. Petersburg, the city where we began our journey. and where the Hermitage Museum cares for the archaeological pieces that we have seen. Through these, we have discovered the peoples who have contributed to the formation of Russia. The inauguration ceremony of the Hermitage took place on the 5th of February, 1852. To celebrate, there was a theatrical performance and a reception for more than 600 guests. It was the time of the Tsars. The lavishness of that celebration is not relevant. The real importance is that, since the Hermitage Museum opened its doors, its collections have preserved the heart and soul of Russia for the world. A spirit that reaches out to us today.